Pardon me? Chorus? Chorus. Okay. Interlude. Got chorus. it. Got it. So let the ruins come to life in the beauty of your name, rising up from the...
Welcome to the worship service of Windsor Chapel. We're glad that you are here with us this morning. Um, we look forward to a time of worship and rejoicing in the Lord with you. We look forward to hearing from Pastor Joshua bring um, God's word to us. And welcome as well to those of you who are um, tuning in online. We're glad that you are there also. I'm going to start with a very familiar psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise God, and please stand and join us. <laughs> Daniel was confined 
Thank you.
heavens fall and the tempest roars, you are with me. When creation falls, still my soul will soar on your mercy. I'll walk through the fire with my head lifted high and my my kids. 
thinking this week, Lord, about my life and how I've been doing this music for over half my life, and I made some assumptions that maybe if we, if we played good enough music that maybe people would come, that we would entertain them to come to worship you, Lord, and I couldn't be more wrong. We don't need a preacher like Spurgeon or Graham. We don't need the music of, of any stars today and, and the, the most common and most popular music. Lord, what we need is you. Amen. So during this time of transition, Lord, I pray that our church focuses on just one thing, and that is we need you, Lord. If we earnestly in our hearts search you and invite you and the Holy Spirit to enter this room your word says that if the people did, in, in Luke 1940 your word says that if the people didn't praise him even the rocks themselves would cry out so Lord we are crying out to you Lord help this church help ourselves help our family problems and be here for our Lord. Be here as our Savior, Lord. Come to this church. We invite you. And we follow you, Lord. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may gather and greet each other.
we prepare for communion this morning, I'd like to read from Luke chapter 24. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty indeed in word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the woman also had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he, was go he were going farther. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scripture to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Good morning. good morning. It's good to be here together uh, in God's house. The communion table, uh, this table of the Lord, is a special time. I think it goes without saying in the life of the church uh, together as a body and for each believer. It is a sign, uh, it is a seal, and it is a means of grace for us. As a sign, this table signifies Christ's death for us on the cross. And as a seal, it binds us to Christ as our Savior, just as a body is joined to its head. As a means of grace, uh, partaking of the bread and wine in remembrance of him, it is food for our souls. Through this, we grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus celebrated this table with his disciples, uh, as we heard, and the disciples celebrated it with each other. So there's a sense that there is a vertical communion, us each with God and a horizontal communion, us one with another here in Windsor Chapel, and of course, at this very hour across the whole country and the whole world. Come to this table not because you must, but because you may. Not because you're strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of any goodness of your own gives you a right, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. 
Come because he loved you and gave yourself, gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ here, for we are his body. If I could call the brothers forward, please, to help with the distribution. As we heard in the reading, the Lord Jesus instituted this table, and it was reaffirmed in 1 Corinthians 11, where it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. It proceeds immediately and says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood and body of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Who should come to the Lord's table? Those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their remaining weakness is covered by the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have trusted in Christ and are walking humbly with him, this table is for everyone. If you have not yet decided to follow Jesus, uh, please abstain from these elements today, but at the same time take heart that God does call you and says, the one who comes to me, I will in no way cast out. At this time, I'll ask Brother Daniel to pray over the bread. Our Father in heaven, we <clears throat> worship and praise you for the body of your beloved Son, our Lord and Savior, who died in our place. We thank you that through him we have redemption and forgiveness of sin. And we just, Father, praise you for this privilege and we ask that we be taught by your spirit to eat worthily unto you in Jesus' name. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to ask Brother John if he would pray over the cup, please. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for allowing us to gather at this table. And we just ask you, you would just bless the cup as it nourishes us, Lord, and help you nourish our soul. Amen. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we love you and we need you and we thank you for who you are and what you've done. Together as a body, as a family, um, needing one another, your death, O oh Lord, we commemorate, your resurrection we confess here today, in your final coming we await eagerly. Glory be to you, O oh Christ, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me to preach uh, at Windsor Chapel. And thank you for the worship team, for your prayer, for your reading scripture, and the Holy Communion. Thank you. Uh, this morning, we'll focus on Gospel Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 35. It's a long passage, but I'll make it short. This passage is long, but the passage is known as on the road to Emmaus. And this passage is talking about two disciples of Jesus. They left Jerusalem back onto the road of Emmaus. And then somehow they met Jesus. They did not know him at first, but later they did. And then they got a revival. And then they quickly walked back to Jerusalem. That's where all the disciples of Jesus gathered. It's as like a Christian who somehow the faith weakened and decided to leave God or leave church. But on the way, leaving on the road back to the world, and uh, Jesus met the person and brought that person back to the Lord and to the church. Let's take a look of this passage. Verse 13. That very day, two of them were going into a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. That very day, in the first verse of Gospel Luke, chapter 24, is talking about the first day of the week. First day of the week, it's known as the day of the resurrection of Jesus. You know what is the first day of the week? It was, according to the Jewish custom, it was Sunday. They consider Sunday as the first day of the week. They just finished the Sabbath. Have you ever wondered why the Jews 2,000 years ago they were deeply indoctrinated by their tradition is that the most important day of the week is Sabbath, is Saturday. How in the world they turn around and begin to worship the Lord on Sunday? There's only one reason. Because they were convinced that Jesus rose on Sunday. So that very day, that's the first day of the week. That's Gospel Luke 24, verse 1. Two of them were going, two disciples. They were the lesser known disciples. They were not like those, you know, the Jesus, the 12, the whatever, but they were the lesser known. The, the, the two of them were going to a village named Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. I already mentioned that from this passage, and we know that these two disciples, they left Jerusalem on to the way to Emmaus because they were disappointed. They were feeling sad. In verse 17, we will read it along, okay? Uh, they were spiritually low. 14, verse 14. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. The original language is emphasizing not just talking with each other, but they were arguing with each other. They were emotionally, you know, they were uh, 
Yep, that's the idea. They were very, very, you know, um, emotionally stirred about this, what happened about Jesus' death and the suffering and, and, and death. Okay. And so, it's like this way. It's almost like uh, in today's version, it's like a person who has invested a lot of his or her wealth upon a certain stock. And then that stock did not help him gain more wealth. So the person is emotionally very disturbed, very disappointed, very upset. Now, like these two disciples, they were following Jesus for a certain period of time. And they were hoping that Jesus would be the one that they, in their mindset, who they want Jesus to be. The Messiah, to save them, to save the Jews from the Romans, etc. It's like today. You invest in the stock, and the stock did not deliver the goods. You were very upset. So the talking with each other is arguing. They were emotionally very, very disturbed. Verse 15, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Jesus showed up. Why did Jesus show up at this time? Jesus didn't show up to them when they were spiritually strong and powerful, high, spiritually high. But Jesus appeared to them when these two disciples were disappointed, sad, and so on. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. How are you feeling today? The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. So Jesus appeared to these two disciples. They were brokenhearted, disappointed, sad, and crushed in spirit. Verse 16, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Some people say their eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus because, you know, the Emmaus was as west of Jerusalem. And so when they were, you know, going, going back to Emmaus from Jerusalem, it could very well be the sun was shining on their eyes. They couldn't see who Jesus really was. Well, that, that's just one, one theory, okay? And uh, they also, they were feeling sad. You know, when a person was feeling sad, you know what? Everything around that person becomes negative. Have you ever had that experience? You were, uh, you were feeling sad and disappointed and sorrowful. You, in the, you see everything around you negative, sad, uh, emo emotionally, you know, affected, okay? That could happen. But actually, this word, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him, it seems to indicate that their eyes couldn't open, or couldn't recognize Jesus. That some scholars even have said that the, from, this, from this original language, it seemed that, that the Lord, the Lord had kept their eyes from recognizing him. So it's a passive voice. Their eyes were kept from recognizing. Why would, why would Jesus, why would the Lord want to keep their eyes from recognizing him? Later we found out that these disciples, these two, they followed Jesus for a period of time. They knew quite a bit from Jesus' teaching, from Jesus' 
doing the ministry or the work. So in their minds, they were thinking probably, you know, we are the, you know, we are Jesus, the, the followers. We know quite a bit about Jesus. So is it possible from this story that Jesus want them to humbly re realize Though they may have known something about Jesus, but actually they did not know him. Now this applies to us. We've been, I grew up in a Christian home. My father was a minister, missionary, pastor. I mean, you know, I grew up in church. I went to seminary. You know, hey, I know, actually, this verse applies to all of us. Just like the two disciples. Oh, we know, we know him. Now later you find out that when they talk to Jesus about who they know about Jesus, they, they actually, they know quite a bit. But God wants to reveal to them, hey, but it's, you think you know God a lot, but actually you do not. Hey, I was just listening to the prayer of one of the brother in the worship team, right? Now, should we do with the music ministry? Very good. I really enjoyed it. We should. Should we do the preaching and the sermon, do the good job? Yes, we should. We should do everything, do it well. But relying on them alone is not going to work. We know that. Bottom line. We need God. And if we still don't know about that, then we are the outsider. We don't know how to do church work. It's God. Without that, we have nothing. So here are these two disciples. They were kept from recognizing it. Jesus wanted them to say, hey, buddies, I want to help you to know more about him. Verse 17, and Jesus said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Ah, they were feeling sad. I'm not really making up, right? They left Jerusalem in disappointment, feeling sad. Jesus began to have a conversation with the two disciples. But he asked them, do you see that? Hey, and what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? Jesus is a good listener. He wants us to talk to him. He wants us to pour out all our sorrow, our disappointment, our failure, frustration in life. He wants to know. Jesus wants to hear us talk to him. So let me ask you, when was the last time you talked to God? When, when was the last time you actually talked to God? Now also because they did not recognize Jesus at that time. So their, whatever they say about Jesus would be more, would be more truthful. You know, after preaching, I, I come to you and say, hey, how's my preaching? And you already said, oh, very good, very good. But actually, deep down, you say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Why? Oh, because, you know, the courtesy. Yeah. But they didn't know Jesus. Okay, all right. Since they didn't know, okay, I'll tell you. Hey, I'll tell, I'll tell this guy what I think about Jesus. So, this, so in our prayer life, why don't we be truthful to the Lord? And tell God exactly how we feel, how we struggle. We are struggling being, uh, we feel morally weak. We feel spiritually low. We feel frustration in our finance, marriage, family, kids, relationship, work, all kinds. Tell God about it. Be honest. Verse 18. Then one of them named Cleopas 
and answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Now, brothers and sisters, who is Cleopas? Some people, some scholars said it could be the same person in the Gospel John, chapter 19, verse 25. It says, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. Now, this is just a guessing. I just want to let you know. It is some, some Bible scholar thought it could be the same person. John 19, verse 25. We don't know, but I just want to bring it to you. But obviously, this Cleopas was a person that Luke expect all the readers to know who that person was, right? We know very little about this person, so we're going to move on. Verse 19, and he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning the Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and were before God and all the people. Now, Jesus was a good listener, and he asked these two disciples, hey, please speak, speak truthfully, uh, since you don't know me, so talk about Jesus. What, what do you know about Jesus? Right? And so, the, and they said to him, uh, yeah, uh, verse 19, and he said to them, what things? And these two disciples said to him, oh, concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Now, let, me, let us tell you what we have known about this guy, Jesus. Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, he came from Nazareth. A man who was a prophet, means God's, God's representative, God's chosen vessel. He was mighty in deed and word, powerful in teaching, and powerful in what? In doing God's mighty acts. Before God and all the people, all the people witnessed that. They know quite a bit about Jesus. They know. And then verse 20. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered Jesus up to be condemned to death and crucify him. Now here, they were disappointed. Oh, this prophet of God, we follow him. And somehow, these bad guys, who were the bad guys, chief priests, rulers, and they deliver him up to be condemned to death and crucify him. So it's from this passage, it's obvious that these two disciples know a lot about Jesus, but they did not know the meaning of Jesus' death. They did not know. You might know a lot about Jesus, about God. But there are also a lot you may not know. For me, for us, all of us. For these two disciples, they consider Jesus' death as a failure. That's their perception. But little did they know that the death of Jesus is just another new beginning. So that's why Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. So these two disciples, they know a lot about Jesus, but they also know a lot they don't know about Jesus. They don't know. They consider Jesus' death as a failure. But... Jesus' death actually is a new beginning for all of us who believe that he died for our sins. Continue, verse 31, or 21. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. So in their mind, they were following Jesus because they considered Jesus as the redeemer of who? Israel. So now here, brothers and sisters, did you see the story continue to unfold? Is that in these two disciples' mind, there were two groups of bad guys. Number one is verse 20. The chief priests and the rulers, they put Jesus to death. And also number two is verse 21. The Romans, the Roman government, Roman government, they were 
you know, they were in charge of the Jews. And so the Jews don't like it. So these two disciples consider Jesus to be the Redeemer, the Messiah, is to, is to you know, to, to kill all these uh, bad guys, the Romans and the chief priests and all these guys. They were bad guys. We want Jesus to defeat them. All right. But they did not know. They thought they were the good guys. The Romans, the bad guy. Chief priest, ruler, they were the bad guy. Pharisee, bad guys. Sadducees, bad guy. But we are the good guys. Jesus, we expect you to be the Messiah to come and deliver us from all the bad guys because we are the good guy. But Jesus come is saying, hey, buddies, you two are also bad guys. For all have sinned and come short of glory of God. I come not to destroy them. I come to die for every one of you, whether you think you are good or bad. Actually, in the eyes of God, all are sinners. I come to be the redeemer of whoever will believe in Jesus. What a difference between what the two disciples understand about Jesus and what Jesus revealed to them. 22. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were, the, they were at the tomb early in the morning. Very interesting. Uh, verse 23, let's read. And when they did not find his body, the women, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Brother, sister, if you look at the, 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 the gospel, Luke chapter 24, you see the three sections. First section, verse 1 to verse 12. What they're talking about? Talking about the women. The women came to Jesus' tomb first. And then second section is the, what we are talking about. 13, verse 13 to 35. And from 36 onward is another group. Did you notice in this chapter, the first group that Jesus appeared to them were the women. The women at that time were not considered a very viable witnesses. But Jesus appeared to them. The two disciples, they were considered as deserting, abandoning their faith, leaving Jerusalem, going back to Emmaus. They were the second group in chapter 24 that Jesus appeared. Finally, it's the disciples of Jesus. Jesus appeared to them. What am I trying to say? You consider the women and the two disciples, they were they were spiritually, ah, they, 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 they're low, they, they, they're not strong. we the disciples of Jesus. It's the opposite. Jesus appeared to women first. Have you noticed in church, women are very powerful. Women are very powerful, and women also very faithful. Said Jesus on the cross, they were the ones at the last minute. Jesus appeared to them. And then we say, oh, these two, yeah, but they were weak. They, they, they're not considered at the, at the core group where Jesus appeared to them. And the last is the group of the disciples. Very interesting. Do not look down on any one of the brother or sisters. We do not know. God always Surprise us. Verse 24. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Continued. Verse 25. And he said to them, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Verse 
In this verse, I want to draw your attention to one thing. Uh, that is, remember in the previous, uh, I know it's a long passage, but I'll, I'll make it, I hope that make it logical and understandable. Okay. Did you notice that in verse 17, what did they say? And uh, uh, what is this conversation that, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, verse, verse 18. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? The reason I want to read that one is that compare that one, verse 18, and this one is said, uh, uh, Jesus said, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all uh, uh, that the prophet have spoken. Compare verse 17. And verse 25, I want to draw a principle for us. That is, verse 17, the two disciples said, Hey, Jesus, you know that? You know, what the, you know what the Fox News just said this morning? You know what the CNN News just said this morning? You know what the, what, what the, what the, you know, the Fox News and the Republicans say this morning? You know what the CNN say and the Democrat and both the Republican and the Liberal? And what do they say? Did you pay attention to the news today? And then, that's what verse 18. Hey, have you heard of what's going on in Jerusalem? You didn't pay attention to what people say? Verse 23. No, verse 25. Look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, oh, foolish ones. You pay attention to what CNN, Fox News, all these things say. Listen, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophet have spoken. You pay attention to Fox News, CNN, all the time. But you ignored the word of God. Right there. Verse 26. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Now here's a very powerful. Jesus said, hey, buddies, you thought that Jesus died is a failure. That's the end of the story. No. It is prophesied in the scripture about what will happen to the Son of God, to the Messiah. What would happen? That he would suffer. That means be killed. And also, don't forget, that's not the end. That he will enter into glory means he will rise from the dead. Uh, In this verse, I wrote down this. Now I wrote. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided, listen, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with Jesus. Paul understood this principle because he studied the scripture. Jesus said, don't pay attention to Fox News, CNN says. You know, they pay attention to what God says. What is, what is it? Jesus will die. For our sins. But he will enter into glory. He will rise from the dead. Okay, continue. Verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Going back to the scripture. You know, it's very, very interesting. For many people will say, oh, oh, you're so foolish. You're so dumb. Okay. Don't waste my time on you. Anyway, I'll move on. No, no, Jesus spent the whole time talking, explaining. That's the same thing. Jesus 
is very patient with us. Okay. All right. Prof, prophet. How about Isaiah? When you have a chance this week, go back home and read Isaiah 53. It says a lot about Jesus, the suffering servant. Verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He added as if he were going further. Continue, verse 29. So they were just about to part because Jesus was, seemed to me he wanted to continue. Okay, verse 29. But they urged Jesus strongly saying, Oh, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Brothers, sisters, did you notice here? You notice that Jesus was ready to move on. And these two disciples said, no, 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 you got to stay with us. You know, Holy Spirit, God is always there, ready to help us. But he won't force you. He's a gentleman. You don't want God in your life? You know what? Many times, you make God feel sad, but he won't force upon you. In the book of James, chapters 4, verse 7 and 8, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then he says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Did you see that? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. This morning, I urge you, sincere heart, invite Holy Spirit to help you. And he will. Okay, let's continue. Verse 30. Almost done. I'm almost done. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Usually, it's the host of the family that will do the breaking of the bread. But here, these two disciples invite Jesus to come to their place, and then all of a sudden, it changed. Jesus became the host, breaking the bread. It's like you invite Holy Spirit to come into your life. Are you willing? Are we willing to let Jesus, the Holy Spirit, be the boss of our life. Now that, talk about discipleship. That is a hard one, right? But that is the case. Whoever is the host breaks the bread. Jesus turned around. He was the invited guest, but now he's the host. Verse 31. And their eyes were opened. Again, it's passive voice. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he vanished from the sight. You know the word? It, uh, the, the word opened here is the same, has the, the, the word has the same root with the one in verse 27, which is, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures concerning himself. You know the verse 27, the word interpret? Jesus explained to them the scriptures. The word explain, interpret, is the same root word with verse 31. Open. Talk about their eyes were opened. Did you remember in the book of Genesis chapter 3? When the Adam and Eve, the first couple, they disobeyed God and they ate the forbidden fruit, what happened to them? Their eyes were opened and bringing to the downfall of humankind. 
And this time, Jesus opened these two people. A new era, a new day, a new beginning has come. We pray that this morning, God open our spiritual eyes. Verse 32. By the way, read Acts chapter 9. Isn't it Paul on the road to Damascus? Finally, God opened his eyes. Verse 32. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Their hearts were on fire for God. What happened? Because God opened their spiritual eyes and God opened the scriptures to them. Brothers and sisters, that's why the bottom line for the church is God. You can study the scripture all you want. You can do all these things, but you still need to humble yourself and say, God, I need you to open my spiritual eyes. Open my heart. Open your, your word to me. And they were on fire. So, how do they know? Look at here, verse 33. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They waste no time. Immediately, they go back to where the brothers and sisters were in Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together. They would say, we're going to leave the church. We're going to leave Jesus. Forget it. Hey, just... No, they would say, oh, no, 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 let's go back. Their faith becomes strong. How your faith will become strong? You need to read the scripture. You need to pray. But very important, you need the Holy Spirit to open your heart, open your eyes, open the word of God to you. I tell you, to do God's ministry, if we just rely on the human the level of human knowledge, talents, I tell you, we will be humbled. You you need to humble and cry out to God. Jesus said very clearly, wait upon the Lord in Acts. Wait upon the Holy Spirit come. Remember, Jesus said, you ask the Father, He will pour out the Spirit on you. That's what we need. Can we begin to pray? Oh, Father God, in your mercy and grace, pour out your spirit upon us because we cannot do God's work on our own. Continue. Verse 34, saying, The Lord has risen, indeed has appeared to Simon. Oh, my goodness. They don't need any proof anymore. They don't need any proof Because why? Because their faith rises to the level of what God wants them. What is that? Open their heart, open their eyes, open the scripture. Bottom line, God, Holy Spirit. Verse 35. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. I know time's up. I'm going to... Mentioned very quickly. Did you notice one thing about, remember in Jesus, okay, the last words. Let me read it to you, okay? Matthew chapter 8, verse 19 and 20. And a scribe came up and said to Jesus, Hey, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Hey, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Uh, You probably will say, 
What are you trying to connect with today's passage? Foxes and holes, birds of air have nests, but Jesus said, "I have nowhere to lay my head. I don't have a house." What does that mean? Jesus says, "I'm always on the road. I don't even have a house. I'm always on the road." Aren't all of us today in our life journey? We are on the road. Sometimes we are doing well, so we like this. Other times we feel like this because we're nobody. But thanks be to God, Jesus is always on the road, on with us in our life journey. May the Lord and the Holy Spirit be with us on our road of this life journey. Thank you. Final song.
Praise the Lord. Uh, we're not going to pass the plate today because that part of the service was uh, taken by communion, but the box is outside in the lobby. So if you have an offering, uh, please drop it there as you exit. A um, couple of announcements. Um, hope everyone had fun at the egg hunt a few weeks ago. Yeah, I know I did. Uh, it was a beautiful slideshow that I think Bob Seabeth put together uh, last week. That was enjoyable. Uh, we are going to have a debrief. Uh, last year's debrief was very valuable, so if you have comments, anything, observant, uh, observations, please come. It's after church next week, right after the service will be done in time for Sunday school. So next week, and if you can't make it, uh, just email me your comments. Uh, that would be great. Um, Sunday school today, Sunday school next week, uh, off on the 21st, and then resuming on the 28th, and Finally, just a, a heads up for the summer, we are booked with a CEF for Five Day Club the week of July 15th. Uh, it's the same week we've always done it, so hopefully that works. Um, we'll share more about that in the months to come. Okay, let me pray and we'll be dismissed. Uh, Father, we thank you for your grace toward us, uh, demonstrated most of all in Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, uh, and his reigning eternally at your right hand. Thank you that through faith we participate uh, in that and are cleaned from all of our sins and strengthened by your Holy Spirit. Uh, we pray that you'd go with us this week in uh, your joy and your strength and your empowering. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Shine your light.